Hi, so it's almost universally acknowledged that we have a problem. Actually, it's acknowledged we have several problems, but the one that's in my mind is about generation. I say almost universally because, of course, there are some people who deny there's any problem at all. But they're really easy to recognise. They're the ones with the buckets of sand that they're carrying around so they can stick their heads in it. The rest of us more or less agree that there's a problem. And if you look at the population growth, energy demand and energy supply, it's pretty obvious. Energy demand has shot up exponentially, it's gone up like that. Population growth has gone up exponentially. The way we're living our lives and how we're changing from petrol-driven cars to electricity-driven cars is all creating a massive amount of demand for electricity. Now, a power station will take anywhere between sort of 25 to 40 years to build, commission and bring online. So this is huge shortfall in being able to cope with that. And yet, in our modern world, of course, we need to be able to cope with that because all of our lives centre around it. Our transportation, the computers, uh, everything centres around electricity. And so it is becoming, or is already, a serious problem. I mean, you look at the energy price hike that we've just gone through. Some countries have bunged their prices up by 400 to 600% for commercial use of electricity. That's a massive price hike. So it's already recognised there is a problem. Now, when it comes to generation, we really only have two choices. The first choice is where we do everything in big generation plants, massive plants producing lots and lots of energy and distributing it around to us so that we just use it. We don't think about anything. We pay a bill, maybe pay some taxes, flip on a switch, and a light comes on. And that's what we're used to. Now the issue arises not because people don't have anything, that's never the way it is. The issue arises when you have something and it's taken away from you. We're used to behaving in a certain way and we think of it as a right. When that way is restricted, of course, we get upset by it, we get unhappy by it. We get unhappy because we have to do a little bit more. Now I was watching this advert for Alexa, actually. A guy was walking through his house and he was saying, Alexa, make me a cup of coffee. Alexa, turn on the dishwasher. And of course, Alexa did all these magical things. And in the ad, you didn't see the guy filling up the dishwasher, closing it, or filling up the coffee machine. It just magically happened. But of course, he still has to do that work. And Alexa is saving him the effort of pressing a button. I mean, how lazy have we got that we can't peel our sweaty bodies off from a sofa to press a button, that we have to just lay there and say, Alexa, do this for me. It just, uh, well, that kind of thing actually blows my mind and it is a bit of a soapbox because I can't cope with that kind of laziness. It just astonishes me. But we've driven towards this um, idea that we have a right to these things. And of course, we're driven to that because we're just used to it. And when that thing is taken away, we feel like a right is being removed, and of course we get upset by it. Now when you think about generation per se, if it is centrally generated like that, it will fulfil that side of our lives, but it becomes much more of an impossibility when you look at the way energy demand is growing. Because there are other issues with um, energy generation as a centralised system. One of them is it's um, tremendously prone to collapse, which we've seen, of course, just in the last few weeks. There's something like 6,000 homes. I think there's still 1,500 homes without electricity because, the, uh, because we had a storm and it brought the, lights, uh, the lines down. It's taken two weeks to repair it and there's been somewhere between 10,000 and 6,000 homes without electricity. So it is sensitive when it's a centralised system and distributed like that. Of course, there are other systems that you can adopt, and one is where you have a small network system with small people producing something that they feed onto the grid and distribute it. And it's well known that nets like that are much more resistant to damage. They're able to cope with those kind of changes in the way a centralised system can't. So centralised systems have issues just in being able to supply stuff, they have issues in being able to generate stuff, and of course they have issues in how they go around generation. Because with the exception of hydropower, almost universally, of course, what we do is we burn something 
to generate. And that would include nuclear, if you think that we're burning the nuclear fuel, the thorium or uranium or plutonium or whatever it is we use, we are effectively using the heat of reaction to boil some water and spread on a turbine. Exactly the same as coal, exactly the same as oil, exactly the same as gas, we're burning something. Now the nuclear, of course, has an awful lot of proponents. There's a big group of people who just love nuclear. In fact, in France, I think, it's something like 95% of generation in France is nuclear. Because Britain buys about 60% of its electricity from France, so effectively, Britain uses nuclear. Now, there's a, a slight problemette with nuclear, of course, is um, if there's a problem, it's a horrendous problem. Now, the nuclear crowd will tell you it's a perfect system, it's a beautiful system, and there never are any problems. It's exactly the same thing that my bank said to me. I went down to the bank, and the bank said, oh, we're a bank, we never have problems. Six months later, I got a letter of apology from them for a problem they had. Because however beautiful a system is, it has one tiny fundamental flaw, and that's it's run by us. And, and we're people. Being people, we're fallible, and we make mistakes. When those mistakes happen, normally it doesn't really matter. But of course in a nuclear system, if you make a mistake, even one or two mistakes, it has serious consequences where you're evacuating cities, poisoning the air of the world, destroying the waters, and creating irradiated land for miles around. And of course we know this, courtesy of Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, do I need to go on? So even one tiny mistake in a nuclear system can be catastrophic. And of course Fukushima drove Japan to abandon all of its nuclear power. And now they're moving to a different system altogether. And in fact they're becoming the model for the rest of the world. What Japan is trying to do is create a system of microgeneration. Now, microgeneration is the move from that centralized generation to where the individual produces a small amount and we aggregate it together. And of course, it follows the modern way of thinking when you're thinking about distributed industry, where people are producing things with 3D printers and then they're bringing those together rather than going en masse to factories to make them in tens of thousands of people all making one part. We're going much more to a distributed model in terms of manufacture than we have a centralized model, which dominated the world from the uh, Industrial Revolution to the post-war era. There's been a big change in the way that we look at that, and energy is following that change from centralized generation to distributed generation, and Japan is seen as the model for that. So we have a choice. Now, we can centralize and centralize more, or we can decentralize and distribute. Now, that idea of decentralization and distribution is what microgeneration is all about. That is the essence of microgeneration. It does create stability. It does create independence. It does create a sense of you helping yourself to fulfill your own needs. But it's not the instant solution that turning a switch is. And that creates unhappiness in people. Because microgeneration can't be solved with one answer. It's not a magic pill. There isn't just a thing you can do. You can't just put a photovoltaic panel on your roof and hope it's going to supply your needs for the rest of the year. It, it won't. Because we have days when there's no sun. After all, we suffer winter in most of the world. We have days when it's um, not performing as well as it should perform, and most people don't have the land or space, particularly when more than half the people in the world these days live in cities, remember? They don't have the land or the space to provide that energy for themselves using something just like solar. So you have to start thinking about alternatives. Now, energy consumption in the average household is split between heating and uh, ventilation and cooling and the other stuff, the stuff we need to run the washing machine and to light the lights and turn the television on. Me particularly, 75% of my energy requirement is heating, venting, uh, heating, venting and cooling. The other 25% is the rest of the stuff that I need, the washing machine, the fridge and the computers. So a bigger proportion of my expenditure on energy is actually in HVAC. If we can do something else about that, then we can take a huge portion of that and reduce our electricity generation need dramatically. Now there are lots of ways of doing that. You're thinking about things like air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, solar thermal, uh, then there's the uh, things like the zeolite thermal, that sort of stuff. So there's a whole range of things that we can actually use to perform that job and reduce the amount of generation we actually have to do. 
The amount of generation we have to do obviously relies on things like solar photovoltaics and then wind generation and water generation. In fact, if I come back to that briefly in centralised generation, hydrothermal, sorry, hydro um, generation is about the only thing that doesn't burn anything, which is kind of cool. But when we're coming back to micro-generation, as I say, you need to have much more of a strategy about it when you look at those kind of things, rather than a one pill will solve all ills. And of course, that is something we are resistant to. We're resistant to that for lots of reasons, but we are resistant to it. We don't like the idea that we've got to think a little bit more about what it is that we use and what it is that we generate. Because, of course, reducing usage is another way of tackling the energy problem. We don't have that infinite resource where we can just burn whatever we want. We no longer have 12 cylinder cars that will do <laughs> three miles a gallon. And there are good reasons we don't have that anymore, but we don't have it. And we have to start thinking about our energy consumption as well as our energy generation. And that move from centralized energy to smaller scale energy generation based on smaller ideas and lower power generation is, I think, the way that we need to go and to a degree certainly being seen as the way to go. Now one of the things I sincerely like about micro generation is that it shifts that responsibility onto the individual but it also creates a huge area of creativity because there are lots of solutions available to implement. There is not one solution, and that seems to make people unhappy, but there isn't one solution. There's a myriad of solutions, and what's needed, I think, when it comes to microgeneration, is a strategy, a way of looking at the different components of how it is and what it is that you generate and use, and how you can adapt to those. Now that takes a bit more thought than people are used to in our lives and that perhaps is one of the reasons that we're a little resistant to it. Anyway, I thought I would share those ideas with you. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please remember to like and subscribe.